Hey everyone, CJ here, presenting you the final episode of the How to Play Call of Cthulhu series. After learning all the game's mechanics through the series, we have finally reached a point where we actually get to talk about running Call of Cthulhu as a game master, or keeper of arcane lore if you want to use the game's term. I'm going to start with the kind of mindset you should bring to the game. Then I will talk about running published scenarios and I will cap it off with my personal tips and tricks as we witness the finale of our intrepid investigator's adventure. So are you ready to open the Pandora's box of Call of Cthulhu game mastery? Well, ready or not, we're doing it live! First of all, let me start with a hard-to-swallow pill. Not many people out there actually know Call of Cthulhu. Yes, it's big in East Asia, it is following in certain parts of Europe, but that's besides the point. If you are going to run a game, there is a good chance that many of your players are absolutely new to the experience and don't really know what to expect. Now, this is where you come in. Managing expectation is a really important part of a keeper's job, especially for new players who don't know what to expect. Getting your character disemboweled by a mythos abomination as the rest of your paralyzed friends watch helplessly in their personal hell of debilitating madness is an acquired taste. It is normally not on top of anyone's list of fun experience. Oh yes daddy, disemboweled. Normally. So you, the keeper, have to help your players develop it. To be fair, there are countless ways you can enjoy Call of Cthulhu adventures. But traditionally, there are two different modes of play. One-offs or convention play and campaigns. One-offs are usually quite brutal because it is often used to introduce new players to the game or for groups who can't meet regularly to sustain a campaign. It is usually quite deadly because the keeper wants to bring out all the emotions and drama out of one short scenario. That's why it is usually open season for their pre-gen characters. The problem here is that new players may not understand the purpose of the deadliness. Why am I getting punished? Why am I getting killed for roleplaying my characters well? This is where you the keeper need to recontextualize their deaths. By being targeted by mythos monsters, the spotlight is shown on them. They are the lucky ones, they get to die exciting deaths, and everyone around the table will remember it. Campaigns on the other hand are usually slightly less deadly, but it's really up to the keeper. Killing a character your players aren't that invested in can feel hollow, there is no point. So that's why you want to ferment all the drama juice into a rich full-bodied wine before you uncork it and let it explode into a glorious geyser of emotion. By the way, if your end goal is to just kill the characters, it can get boring and predictable. Besides, this is Call of Cthulhu, there are plenty of tools to help you be creative with suffering. Anyway, I will talk about the best moments to kill a character later, so watch out for that. Now we move on to the published scenarios. The great thing about Call of Cthulhu is that the scenarios are often written like a piece of short fiction. They are very readable, especially the newer ones. It has tons of background information, local history, fictional history of the enemy group or organization, NPC past and motivations, and so on. Paradoxically, its strength can also be a drawback for new keepers. It requires quite a bit of reading to understand what the whole scenario is about. Many, if not most published scenarios are quite sandboxy. So the order of events may be dependent upon the player's action and initiative and keepers have to stay on their toes to adapt to them. That can also be a problem for new players or players who are more used to dungeon crawling adventures. Some groups, even many adults, may not have the social coordination and finesse to lead a group investigation. So the responsibility would usually fall on you, the keeper, to direct that investigation. Yeah, there are tons to read, but it is okay to skim through them and remember only the crucial bits. Here is a quick cheat. If you want to pick up the most important features of a scenario, you can just jump to the back of the scenario and look at the conclusion section. 
Certain actions will reward the player's sanity points or penalize them. So immediately, you can know what are the most important plot points to focus on. Don't be pressured to use all the information because it might actually bog down the game. The investigator and the mystery are more important than the setting details. Also, when there are a lot of NPCs in a scenario, it might be a good idea to just focus on one or two. Well fleshed out NPCs are much more interesting than half a dozen of one dimensional NPCs. But the option is there for you to choose which NPCs to focus on because there are usually tons of information written on most of them. Remember, you bought these products. Make them work for you, not the other way around. Okay, now let's move on to tips and tricks on running the game. To illustrate the point, I will go back to the story. Due to the sudden death of Phineas, Rosalind was able to persuade Lucille to go to the cultist's hideout with the promise of reviving him. Rosalind had been working for the cultist all along, but she has her reasons. Secret Roles is a commonly used convention in the Call of Cthulhu gaming community. It is not always part of the scenario, but it can be a fun addition. However, if not done well, it can potentially cause a campaign to collapse, as the betrayed investigators will never work with the traitor anymore. So if possible, make the revelation closer to the end of the campaign, so you can end it with a bang. Or perhaps you can make the betrayal not as directly harmful to the party. Rosalind, for example, had been promised that they will resurrect her husband if she were to bring Lucille to their hideout. Now that she had fulfilled her end of the bargain, Rosalind demanded the cult leader to follow through with his promise. Bring back her husband and don't harm the young ones. The cult leader laughed. He said that it is all too easy to bring her husband back and unmask himself. He revealed a grotesque visage, blasphemous to the human form, and the recognition of a faintly human face, one that Rosalind used to love under an overlapping drape of posture, assaulted her rationality. Now for the fate of your little friends. Whatever he told her is written in this handout note. A common device used in Call of Cthulhu is the handout notes. These are sometimes clues or notes used to relay hidden information. It can make the player feel special if they receive a handout from the keeper, but it can also be distracting, especially if that player has to focus on it and read it in the middle of the game. So it takes quite a bit of skill to use the handout well. If all the investigators are together at the same time, you might as well paraphrase the handout and hold it back from them until a break or a party split. Giving them the note is actually a great way to end a split party scene as they have something to occupy themselves with while you deal with the other group of investigators. Meanwhile, at the other side of the hideout, Scott was separated from Lucille. But before he was shoved into a cell, I asked the player to make a spot hidden role. In Call of Cthulhu, keepers often call out skill roles. Usually, this is done to see if the investigator will stumble onto extra clues. Generally, you don't want to let your players miss major clues especially if you don't want the game to end prematurely. Even if Scott had failed, he would still see the unattended boat in the Catherine Dock, an escape route. But since he succeeded on his role, he also saw where the key is stored by the cultist. In the ritual room, Lucille is held fast by cultist minions. The cult leader told her that all she needs to do to get her uncle back is to sing this hymn. That's it? Lucille asked skeptically. That sounds too easy fishy for me. What if I don't wanna? The cult leader laughs. He assures her that one way or another, the master of the Nightmare Corp city will awaken. They were just accelerating the inevitable so that they can witness the momentous event firsthand. It is futile to resist. By now, Rosalind had recovered from the shock of the revelation. The love of her life is no longer who he was. She must also tell the rest of the group the other things she had learned. There is more at stake here than their lives. A good keeper knows when to withhold information. Rosalind has something very important to tell the others, but I forbade the player to say it until she could reach them. In certain circumstances, I won't even let the player look at the handout until they could reach the other investigators. To get to the others, Rosalind decided to disguise herself as a cultist. But she doesn't get to make the disguise roll now. 
obviously the investigator would do their best to disguise themselves. But whether the disguise is effective or not, it is up to the observer to judge that. I call this technique delayed skill roll. The player would only make the skill roll at the most critical time. This technique can help keep the suspense up. Instead of letting the player feel too safe if they made a really good roll before executing the plan. After doing everything she needed to do, Rosalind released Scott from his cell and told him that everything the cultists had told her was a lie. The dead can't be resurrected and they must find a way to get out of here. Scott told her about the unguarded boat and he can get them out of here. All they needed to do now is to rescue Lucille. But how? Scott asked Rosalind. Rosalind burst through the ritual room with gun ablazing, painting every surface you could see with a coat of lead. Many unlucky cultists were killed, while others managed to scramble behind cover. Scott took the opportunity to run in and grab Lucille who was still half entranced. But before they could reach the boat, Lucille pulled away from Scott. No, she cannot run now. Not after the horror that was revealed to her. Only she can stop it now. For some reason, they cannot harm her so she has a good chance of succeeding. She told Scott to run and forget about her. No buts, stay safe, she whispered before running back into the ritual room. Now is a good time to talk about killing characters, or at least attempting to kill them. Here is a quick graph. Usually killing characters early on is quite okay. It may be a bit jackassy, but at that stage, the player still hasn't gotten too attached to the characters and the character hasn't made any narrative impact to the campaign, so it is kinda acceptable to kill them. Another good spot is on their character arc. It makes a great tragedy if the spotlight is shown on them when they are killed. One of the worst moments for a character to die though is just before the campaign climax. Starting a new character then is kinda weak because there is just not enough time to develop the character and it can feel really out of place to have a new character suddenly join the campaign climax. Phineas's death for example is a bit of a downer, but the player wasn't able to come for the last few sessions, so I had to tie up some loose end. One way to prevent this is to build up a roster of investigators through the campaign, so that there is always a story relevant replacement. The climax of course is the prime time for character death, but just putting them in danger all the time is less artful. Sometimes I do the complete opposite. Consider this. I tell Scott's player that if he decides to leave now, there aren't going to be any repercussions. He will escape safely and maybe lose a bit of sanity. And that's it. All he has to do is to choose to leave. I usually help my players develop their characters and help them tell their story. In this situation, he will be asking himself, does running away make for a good story? Yeah, staying alive is overrated anyway. Back in the ritual room, the cultists have managed to overpower Lucille. Obviously, she can't fight them all alone. But cavalry soon arrived. Scott navigated the boat through the narrow cave canal, plowing into the ritual room and heading right for the cultists. Boats, man. In Call of Cthulhu, they are like weapons of mass destruction. The cultist underlings scattered. But when the cult leader tried to move, his legs were held in place by Rosalind, who was shot unconscious earlier. It is too late for him now. The resulting impact created a deafening wail of sheer metal, not unlike the alien death throes of one vanquished elder god. From within the rubble, Lucille found Scott. The impact from the collision had thrown him off deck, and his fate is sealed. There are so many things he wanted to tell her now, but he only had the remaining energy to say, Happy birthday. Then a cold sinister laugh interrupted <laughs> Lucille's cry. He told her that if she thought that by killing him she had stopped his master from returning, then she is sorely mistaken. His return is only a matter of time. He will eventually be roused to this world by someone more fitting to the task. A blessed child of Mother Hydra who was stolen by an unwitting fool. When she eventually reaches maturity, her intimate blood will manifest, and she shall be the one to end Cthulhu's slumber. In the cosmic scheme of things, he is just a pretender trying to steal a taste of glory by hastening the inevitable. This is her past, her origin, everything she had sought to know, 
and her fate apparently is to become the very thing she stood against her whole life. Well then, the answer is simple, she said. You know, Call of Cthulhu is often made out to be a difficult game. Players are often put in a no-win situation, and that's usually the nature of a Lovecraftian horror, where we are put in the mercy of elder gods with alien minds. But difficulty for difficulty's sake is obviously pointless. I put my players in unwinnable situations to help draw out their investigator's character. It is like the Kobayashi Maru simulation in Star Trek. For those unfamiliar with Star Trek lore, the Kobayashi Maru is a Starfleet training exercise that puts cadets in unwinnable situations so that their response in stressful situations can be observed. And this is the moment where they either crumble or shine the brightest. Either way, the result is more entertaining. Now, Lucille changed her mind. Scott and Rosalind saved her at the cost of their own lives. She is not going to let their sacrifice go to waste. Her enemy is her future self. Yet, who but herself knows more about her own weaknesses? So, she will spend her remaining lucid years laying out traps, setting up organizations, and creating the resources to turn her future self into a Manchurian candidate. Her cursed future will be the linchpin to the destruction of the cultist network once and for all. She will destroy them from the inside with the help of future investigators. Years later, a newspaper reported that the heiress of the Han Food Empire mysteriously disappeared after visiting a famous hypnotist. You know, something used to bug me about the story of Pandora's box. Why is hope found in the bottom of a box that's supposed to contain all the evils in the world? After a bit of thinking, I realized that it actually makes sense. Hope is the greatest condiment for evil. Cosmic horror is an incomprehensible juggernaut of otherworldly conspiracy that will inevitably overwhelm humanity. In the Lovecraftian canon, we humanity always lose. In the face of this kind of hopelessness, the only reasonable response is to run away. Coincidentally, in Call of Cthulhu, new players who do nothing but run away is actually a recurring problem. But evading responsibility and danger doesn't make a fun adventure. The novelty usually doesn't last for more than a couple of sessions. If you plant the seed of hope, however, and make your players think that just somehow they might win, then they will be smiling as they charge into the slaughterhouse. Alright, that's the end of the How to Play Call of Cthulhu series. Doing this series has been a ton of hard work, but I'm really proud of how it turned out. I wish a series like this existed when I was learning how to play myself. Well, at least now you guys do. By the way, if you want to help the channel, you can do so by sharing the series to your friends, use the affiliate links below to buy the rulebook, and also by getting the series merchandise. One last thing, go out there and play the game already. For goodness sake, I'm not making this series for nothing. CJ, over and out.